What's good, everybody? In my video, we have a student requested video on the EOC. If you find this video helpful, smash the like button for us and leave a comment down below. So problem number one tells us to complete the square. And for us to complete the square, we need to pay attention to this middle term. Why? Because it's going to help us create our trinomial and help us solve the problem. So to create the trinomial, we need to understand what is half of 20. That's 10. Once we square 10, we're going to get 100. Why are these two pieces of information important? When we write out our trinomial, we're going to have x plus 20x plus 100. So this is the perfect square trinomial. And we need to make sure that once we add 100 here, we add it on the other side of the equation. So now we're going to simplify. So this side right here is just positive 60. And now we're trying to figure out what binomial gets me this. And we already know, 10, right? So we're going to simplify this to x plus 10 squared is equal to 60. Once we expand this, we'll get this trinomial here. So our next step is, hey, we got to get rid of this exponent. So I'm going to take the square root of both sides. Exponent cancels out. We're left with x plus 10. And this is equal to, and don't forget your signs, plus or minus radical 60. Now, anytime you have a radical, guys, just, just double check to see if you can simplify, if you could break it down. And we can. So when we look at 60, right, we could break this down into 4 times 15. And a perfect square, we have one. So 4 turns into 2, 15 stays under the radical because it's not a perfect square. So as we finish this off now, I have x plus 10 is equal to plus or minus 2 times the radical 15. Now, last step, we subtract 10, and our final answer is x is equal to negative 10 plus or minus 2 times radical 15. So this is how we complete the square. Let's go on to problem number two. So in problem number two, guys, we have absolute value in systems of equations. But this is a little bit different from what we're used to. When it's in this format, when it's y is equal to, we could solve this and find a solution, the point of intersection, by setting the equations equal to each other. Now just remember, when we have absolute value, that means we're going to have two equations, right? So this right side is not what's going to change. It's going to be the left. So our first equation will stay the same. 3x minus 5 is equal to x minus 7. But our second equation, 3x is going to change, right? So we have negative 3x, negative 5 turns to positive 5, and x minus 7 stays the same. Now let's go ahead and solve this first one. When I combine my x's, I'm going to have 2x minus 5 is equal to negative 7. Bring 5 over. We're going to get x is equal to negative 1. Let's just remember that answer, okay? And then the same thing here. Negative 4x plus 5 is equal to negative 7. We'll have negative 4x is equal to negative 12. x is equal to positive 3, all right? So now I have two answers, right? We have the x, but we don't have the y. So now what we're going to do, we're going to plug this back in and see which one of these is going to solve both of the equations, okay? So matter of fact, let's switch to red. So let's do x minus 1. So we have 3 times negative 1 minus 5. We're going to get y is equal to negative 8, right? Negative 3 minus 5, negative 8. In the second one, we have the absolute value of negative 1 minus 7. So what we're saying is y is equal to the absolute value of negative 8. So that means y is equal to positive 8, right? So off rip, I could tell that something's not right with this answer because one equation gives me a positive 8, another equation gives me a negative 8. So what I could do is let's, let's, let's cross this out. It doesn't seem like that works, right? Because I didn't get the same answer. Now let's go over here and see what happens when I plug x is 3 into my equations. So first one, let's do 3 times 3 minus 5. 
So we get 9 minus 5, which is equal to 4. Y is equal to 4. And in our second equation, we have Y is equal to the absolute value of 3 minus 7. So Y is equal to the absolute value of negative 4. Y is equal to positive 4. So now I notice when I plug this 3, positive 3, into my equations, I get the same Y for them. So this must be the answer. And that is when X is 3, Y is going to be 4. So my answer would be B. So don't fall for this trick. Make sure you plug it back in and check both equations. Time consuming, but you'll definitely get it right. On to problem number three, guys, we're talking about graphing and shading inequalities. So number one, what we need to know is because it's just greater or less than, we're going to have a dashed line. So if it's multiple choice, those two answers that are solid lines, eliminate them. So there's two ways we could do this. So the first way, we could subtract 4x and have 2y is less than negative 4x plus 6, right? Get in the slope intercept form. Go back, divide by 2, and get y is less than negative 2x plus 3, right? What I'm going to do in this problem is just try to save you guys time because they're not worried about gra necessarily graphing. They're more focused on the shading. So let's use intercepts, right? So when I cover up the y, y is 0, right? 4x is less than 6. So let's write that. 4x is less than 6. When I divide by 4, I'm going to get x is less than 6 over 4. And just remember, that is what? 1 and 1 half, basically, guys, right? 1 and a half. So that means that's probably going to be over here somewhere, right? And if you haven't caught on, I'm graphing by intercepts. I just plot in the x and y intercept, right? So here goes the x-intercept. Now when we do the same thing, 2y is less than 6, right? 2y less than 6. When we divide by 2, y is less than 3. So that's right here, right on the y-axis. So now we're going to draw our line in. And like I just said, this should be a dashed line because it's greater or less than, right? So there goes our line. Now we need to know, hey, am I shading on this side or am I shading on this side? If you're like me and you forget, pick a point. We're going to pick 0, 0 and plug it into the original equation. So what does that mean? When we simplify it, 0 is less than 6. That is true. When we plug that in, 0 is less than 6. So this means we're going to shade in this area where the point 0, 0 is. And that would be right here. So if you forget how to switch it into slope intercept form, graph by your intercepts, pick a point, and you'll know whether to shade. If it's a true statement, you're going to shade in the area where the point is. If it's a false statement, you're going to shade on the opposite side. Now let's go to problem number four. We're moving on to problem number four, guys. And if you've enjoyed this video, like I've said, please smash the like button for us. It really helps us to get more students to see this. So we have a square, and they ask us, what is the area? So two things to remember. Just because we have a radical, don't trip. It's real simple. I got you. And two, just remember that all these sides are 5 radical 9m because all sides have the same length. But just don't get it confused with perimeter. So we know area is length times width. And this is a very simple problem if you just remember the foundations, meaning coefficient with coefficient, 5 times 5 gives me 25, radical with radical. So 9 times 9 gives me 81, m times m gives me m squared. But this is the trick part. They may have this answer there on the quiz, test, EOC. This would be wrong. We have to break it down, right? Remember, 81 is a perfect square. So this is 25 times the square root of 81, which is 9, times the square root of m squared, which is m. So now when we break this back down, we're going to get 25 times 9, which will give us 225 meters squared. In our next problem, guys, we're working with simplifying radicals with a fraction. 
So very important rule, we cannot have a fraction where there's a radical in the denominator. So we have to rationalize it, meaning multiply the top and bottom by this radical, okay? So once we do that, we're gonna have radical eight, right? And let's do the bottom first. So we're gonna have 30 m squared times itself. That's what we mean when we say rationalize it. And then we're gonna go ahead to the top and do the same exact thing. So as a result, on the bottom, we're just gonna get 30 m to the second power, right? Because once you multiply the same radical by itself, it's just a, it's the same term without the, the radical. Oh, I'm so sorry, guys. Whew. All right. Then we go back up to the top, and once we multiply, we're going to get 240 m to the second power. And what's going to be interesting is we're going to try to divide 240. And I think the largest perfect square that goes into 240 is 16. So. Oops, let's not forget this. I'm sorry, guys. So once we break this down now, this is what we are going to get. Let's break this up high up over here. So we're going to, when we have variables, I always tell students, hey, keep your variable, the exponent, the even exponent with your perfect square. So what does that mean? When we break this down, we're going to have 16m squared times 15. Now, when we break it down, this turns into 4m radical 15 all over 30m to the second power. Now, what makes this challenging, guys, is that there's so much things going on. We have a fraction, we have radicals, and now we have properties of exponents. But before we get there, let's simplify this fraction. If I divide both of these numbers by 2, I'm going to get 2m radical 15 all over 15 m squared. Now, the last thing that we have to do is take care of m divided by m squared. So when we have a, a fraction and we have exponents involved, we're going to subtract the bottom from the top. So we'll do m to the first power minus 2, which will give us m to the negative 1. So what we would have is 2m to the negative 1 radical 15 all over 30. But you guys know we cannot have neg negative radicals. So we're going to take m to the negative 1 and bring it down to the bottom of our fraction. And as a result, my final answer would be, let's write it right here, 2 radical 15 all over, oops, I'm sorry all over 15m. So when you guys are doing these type of problems, oh, why did I put 30, I'm sorry. When you guys are doing these type of problems, guys, just double check your work, make sure that you check everything, such as property of exponents, fractions, radicals, all of that, all right? Let's go on to our next problem. So in our last two problems of this EOC review, we're gonna practice all the skills that we learned in previous videos here. So what we're gonna do, right? We have a radical, and it, what they want us to do is take it from exponent form, switch it into radical form. And what we need to know, right, 24c is under the radical. We should always know that that top number in the uh, fraction is going to be our power, and the bottom number is our root. So that's the most important thing for us to know. Now we're going to break this down, but we're not going by square roots. We're going by cube roots. So is there a cube root for 24? No, 24 is not a perfect cube, but if we try to break this down, I know that 8 times 3 could give me that answer. Now, when we look here, we can't take the cube root of 3 because there's no cube root, and there's no cube root for c to the second power. But I can take the cube root of 8, which is just 2. And as a result, what I'm going to have is 3c squared under the radical. And just remember, guys, this is a, a root of 3. So now when we look back at this, we know the only answer could be d. So just please make sure you know whether it's going to be a cube root or a square root. And that's very important to solve this problem. Guys. Last problem of the day, guys. So they ask us, which is equivalent 
to the radical fear. So we have two times the cube root of x to the fifth power. And they give us four answer choices. So the first thing I want you guys to understand is that what's taken to the what's taken to the power is going to be the x. The two is on the outside. So what does that mean? When we look at our answers, we're not going to apply the fraction or the power, I should say, to both of these, right? That's that's not going to be the case. Only x is under the radical. So we're only going to apply that fraction, that power to the x. Once we have it in parentheses, it's applying it to both the 2 and the x. So that's why b and d are gone. Now we're at a and c. We have a 50-50 chance. And we're saying, hey, which one is it? So remember, a over b So we know that the top number is our power and the bottom number is our root. So please make sure that you guys remember this translation, this relationship, because it'll make it easier. So what we're saying is, hey, that top number, the power, should be A, which is 5, and the bottom number, the root, should be 3. And when I look at my answer choice, my answer choice would be A. And that wasn't even with any math, guys. I was just understanding the concept behind the foundation. And hopefully you guys liked this video and it was helpful. Take your time on your EOC. Really read the question. Read it twice. Hope you guys do well with it. Good luck. Smash the like button. This was helpful for you guys. And join us next time on Algebra 1 with Mr. Peters.